wabudu Beleza koni na inama Mimi ni na kuwabudu Mikono yangu ni na inua Mimi ni na kuwabudu Seme baba
baba wamebariki wa wanaotafuta uso wake Mungu baba uso wake Mungu baba uso wake Mungu baba siku uso wake Mungu baba uso wake Mungu baba sema uso wake Mungu baba uso wake Mungu baba sisi wana wako tumekusanyika angalia baba church welcome to today's and service for those joining in on zoom karibuni sana my name is nathan and my sister i will invite my sister to share with us some for today good morning good morning, morning. my name is maxine i'll be reading from psalms 93 the lord reigns he is robed in majesty the lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength Indeed the world is established firm and secure. That's right. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their coming Let us pray. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are mighty and powerful and we acknowledge your majesty. We are grateful that you have chosen us to bless us and to gather us to gather us here today to seek and praise your name. We are weak and undeserving, but through your mercy you have shown us favor. This morning as we come before you, there are those amongst us that are sick, needy and troubled. We pray for your healing hand. We ask that you may provide We pray for Gitao that you may restore his health. As we continue with this service, may our singing come to you as sweet smelling incense. May our hearts be open to learning from your word. We love you and thank you. In Jesus name we pray.
morning, church. Yeah, at this moment, we have come to another special part of our service, whereby we need just to reflect on our life, the way we live as disciples, as we reflect and focus on the cross, on the message of the cross. Today, for, the, for those who don't know my name, I'm Kaspar Amram from Single Ministry, and also I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. The scripture that will help us today to reflect on our lives as we live as disciples, as we focus our minds on the cross of Jesus Christ, comes from the book of Isaiah chapter 50, 53. We read from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. We'll list, I'm going to read three verses. That is from verse 4, 5, and 6. Are we there? Are you read? Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 4. It says, Yet it was our weakness he cried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. Verse 5. But he was beast for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was, he was beaten for, so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Amen, church. Today's scripture is very clear and direct to the point. And it shows us how Jesus Christ died on the cross because of our sins. And it, it does, Jesus Christ did not deserve to go through this, but because of the sins that we as human beings that that, we, that are in, in us that make him to go through all those suffering that the Bible has been able just to put it to put it clearly. If I'll be able just to read it again as I explained to you how the love of Jesus Christ and the love of God that shows that great how we really need to know how Jesus Christ was able just to suffer because of our wickedness. If I just start it again from verse 4, the way it says, yet it was our weak weakness, it was our weakness as human beings that made Jesus to drive on that on the cross. It's our weakness, the weakness that is in us, the weakness, the status of us not being unable to resist the devil. It was the one that made Jesus Christ to, Jesus Christ to, to go through all those pains and even just cry on the cross. It was that weakness that we cannot be able just to defend or to resist the devil in our life, in our daily life, that makes Jesus to go through all those, all those suffering. In part B of the, the same, same verse, it says, it was our sorrows that weighed him down. It was our sorrows as, as human beings that weighed Jesus down. Sorrows, sorrows in simple terms means that feeling of great sadness whereby we were, we were after involving ourselves in each and every time in sins that make us to regret at the end of it. It was the one that made Jesus Christ to be weighed that down. Amen, church? It was, but, 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 but B, but C of verse 4, it says, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God. No, it was not a punishment from God. We thought it's a punishment for his own sin. It was a punishment that Jesus Christ went on, went through it because of our, our sins. And it's not because of his sins. Verse 5, it says, But he was pissed for our rebellion. Pissed in simple terms, how can I explain? Just to make, pissed is just to make holes in something uh, by, just to make hole through a point, a sharp point of something. Jesus Christ's body was there were some holes that were being made on him while he was being crucified on the cross. 
And that one, it was not, he did not deserve it. He did it because of the love that he had for us as disciples. Whereby the Bible is saying, but he was pleased for our rebellion. Our rebellion as disciples, our rebellion as human beings, our rebellion as Christians. Rebellion, rebellion in simple terms just means an open resistance. Whereby we resist even to follow the God's command. That, thing that, that we as human beings we resist following God's command, that the one that makes Jesus Christ to go through, even he was being able to be, be that the way the Bible is, is being able just to threaten to us. B, but B says that Jesus Christ was crushed, crushed for our sins. Crushed, crushed means to press, to press hardly, very hard, so that, very hard so that to make something to get, to be broken. Imagine Jesus Christ went through that. His boat was pressed that hard so that we, as human beings, we could be, we could be wall. Wall means well, so that we could be one, means so that we could be perfect before the eyes of the Lord. That Jesus Christ went through all of those so that to make us, we as human beings, so that we can be able to be perfect before the eyes of the Lord, to be complete. That is why Jesus Christ what was crushed. The Bible goes on and says, Jesus Christ, he was beaten so we could be wall again. He was whipped so we could be healed. Jesus Christ also, the Bible is telling us that he was whipped so that, all, so that we, as human beings, we weak, weak human beings, we could be healed. Healed so that we could be okay. Healed in, yeah, in simple terms just mean to be okay. That means that before that, we were not okay. We, were, we can say we were sick. Uh, and when we say you are sick, that means that your body system cannot be able to work normally. So Jesus Christ went through all this he, he was whipped so that we could be healed. This morning we may be here as disciples. We may be suffering, we may be sick, we may be not be able to do the normal thing that we are supposed to be doing as disciples. We have the thing that we know we need to be doing as disciples that each and every time when you wake up, each and every time when we live, every second you need that I need to be doing these such and such things in my life. That shows that I'm a disciple. You may be, you may be a, a sick disciple, a sick disciple who is not unable to do the thing that he, he or she is supposed to be, to be doing. For example, as disciple, we know that we have been given that authority to evangelize. If not, for example, if not, you are, you are not able to do the right things. You are a sick disciple. But we are seeing the Bible is saying that Jesus Christ, he was whipped so that we could be healed. You could be a disciple who is, not, who is not praying as we are supposed to be doing each and every time in our life. If you could not be doing such things, you just know that maybe in one way or the other, you are a suffering disciple. You are not well, but you are not well. Your body system cannot be, cannot be functioning as it should be functioning. You, learn, you need to be doing things that you are supposed to be doing as a disciple. You need to be praying. You need to be evangelizing. You need to be doing God's work as normal. So we need to ask ourselves if you are sick or you are healed. But the Bible is saying that uh, it's telling us that Jesus Christ was whipped so that we could be we could be healed. Uh, verse, verse 6 it says, all of us like sheep, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Amen, church? The Bible is saying clear that Lord, Lord laid on him, on Jesus Christ, the sins of us all. That means that it was our sins that, that, that make Jesus to go through all those things that the Bible has been able to illustrate up there. I, if I can just explain again in verse 6, the Bible is saying that all of us, all of us like sheep, we have all of us, we have, we have strayed away. I was just, when, while I was reading this verse, this is something that just came on my mind, whereby I was just being able to ask myself, what, what are those, some of the things that are making me to get away from the path of Jesus Christ, from the path of Lord? And why am I going astray from there? The right, the right path that I'm supposed to be on as a disciple. If, well, if you are here, all of us, who are here, we need to be able just to ask ourselves, what are some of these things that make us to get away from the path of Jesus Christ, from the path of the Lord? Maybe 
initially we were just on the right track. But it reached somewhere, you just care to yourself that you are going out of that, of the way that you are supposed to be doing. There are some things, even we as disciples, we as human beings, God can be able to place you with something that, the same, same thing that you are being able to be placed with by God. They are the ones that make you to get away from, from God. So I was asking myself just what are these things, what are some of these things that make me to get away, to get away, to stray away as a lost sheep, to get away from God's path, to be not on the right way. Are, are there things that I, I myself, can I be able to identify, to identify them so that I can be able just to get, a, to get rid of them? What are some of these things? Even you, as you are here, as you are going to start this week, as we going just to leave this place. You ask yourself, what are some of these things that can make you to get away from God? Are the things that God has placed you with, or are the things that you, you owe each and every time you get associated with? God has placed us with, maybe with, let's say, wealth, or even good jobs, that are the ones, the same same thing, thing that have kept us from, from God. We have been placed with, even with families. We have those, are, are those things that make you to get away from God. We have things, even the same same thing that the Bible has just illustrated on up there, like rebellion, like being weak in a certain way, being a weak disciple, a disciple who do not want to do the right thing that he is supposed to be, to be doing each and every time. Maybe you, have, you are just a selfish person. Is that that make you to get away from God? Maybe the pride that you have, is that the same, same thing that make you to get away from God? What is this? What is this that really make you to get away from God? Uh, brothers and sisters, the thing that make Jesus Christ and the Lord, to even God our Lord, to just to give his only son, to come and go through all those things that the Bible has tell us this morning, it was because the love that Jesus Christ had for us. It was the love that God had for us. Even the Bible it says in John chapter 3, verse 16, for so God loved the world. That is why he gave his and only son to come and die on our behalf. And that is something that we really need to ask ourselves. If someone, if someone loves you, uh, sometimes I hear they say that love is a two-way traffic thing. I mean, Josh, Marius can explain that one better. That whenever someone shows that love to you, you need also for him to feel it also. Whereby, you, when you are there, Jesus Christ has shown us this love. He has gone through all those pain because of our wickedness, because of our sins. The pain that the Bible has just put it there. He was being whipped. He was being crushed. He was being, he was being pissed. And a lot of those pain. But it was because the love that Jesus Christ had for us. It was the love that God himself, his Father, our Lord, the love that he had for us, that he allowed his only and beloved son to go through the, those pain. So this morning, just ask yourself, do you have that love for God also? Because we can be able just to see this love that God has really, really illustrated and shown to us. Ask yourself, do, you, do I, even those people who are around you, those people whom you work with, those people whom you live with, where you live, if someone can ask them, so and so, does he has or can he be able just to show any love that he has for God? Because we can be able to see this. God, I know, God is not somewhere whereby you can see that I can say that Lord is in Moja. Let me just buy bread and, and milk to go and visit him so that I can show him the love. No. With the things that we do, the way, that, the way we live our life as disciples, that shows if we love or we don't love God. The things that you do, mostly even in situ where people don't see you, or don't, where people don't know you as a disciple. Those are the things that shows how, how you love God. So you just ask yourself this morning, do you really love God? Because we can be able just to see from today's scripture, the way God loves us, the way Jesus Christ went through all those pain because of the love that he has for us. Let us ask ourselves, as we focus on the cross this morning, let us just ask ourselves, do, do I really have that love 
for God. Do I really have that love for Jesus Christ? Because he can be able just, we can be able just to see all these things that Jesus Christ was able to go through because he loves us. We can be able also to see how God, he loves us, that he gave his one and only son just to come to cry on the cross because of our sin. So as we live today, as we live even this place, as we go, we start our new week. Ask yourself. Uh, that's two special question that I will just give it to you also at my side. What are some of the things that make you go astray from God's path? That is one question that you just make a meeting between you and yourself. Two, just ask yourself, do I have love after God showing all this love for me? Do I have any love that anything that I do as a disciple, how I live my life, that shows that I really love God? Amen, church? Those are the questions that I will leave it to you as we focus this morning on the cross or the cross of the Lord that you really need to ask yourself. Amen. At uh, this time, I will be able to pray for the bread that resembles the body of Jesus Christ and also the wine that represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Also, the giving that we are going to give towards those who are in need among us and the poor. Let us believe and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you again this morning to say thank you, Lord, for the just free gift of life that you have given unto us. Father, this morning we also thank you, Father, for the life of Jesus Christ, your Son, whom you gave to come and die on the cross because of our sin. Lord, enable us just to be able to learn how to be able just to be away and to get a read and to put efforts in our life to make sure that we get rid and we get focus on the cross as we'll be able just to get away from sins of each and every time. Let us, let us also be able just to learn further how we need to be living a true life of a true Christian, whereby we just need to show love towards you as you, have, as you, have, as you always do for us. God, let us be able also just to learn how to be away from all the sin that each and every time that make us take your son, Jesus Christ, back on the cross. Despite of us being able just to see this painful thing that he went through because of our sin. Lord, just enable us, Father, to be living life that will be, oh, that will please you each and every time. To live a true life, a righteous life that we know it's not easy, but we will really, if we ask you to help us, we can be able just to live it. Father, we pray for the sea service and the past that has been remaining to be powerful. As we are here, Lord, we just pray that we know we are wicked, wicked human beings that do evil things each and every time. Even as we are here in this service, Lord, we know that they, maybe in one way or the other we have things inside our heart that may make us not even just to listen and make our heart to receive your word in the right way. But Father, Lord, you just work on our hearts. Father, you could in placing us. Be with this service. Be with each and everything that is going to happen, even at the rest of the day, as we continue in placing and worshiping our name. Be with us. Make each and every step that we make, you, Father, let us be able just to follow you and to do the right thing that will always please you. I'm praying all these things in Jesus' name.
to those who are listening to us uh, via Zoom, karibuni sana. Thank you, Kaspar, for the communion message and just taking us through what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us and why he went to the cross. So today, my name is Male. I want to lead us through uh, the message. My thoughts exactly. That is, will be the title. Let us pray. Our Lord, we are grateful for giving us yet another Sunday to be in your presence, in your sanctuary. Uh, we are grateful for giving us life. Uh, thank you for the families that we have. Thank you for the friends, the schoolmates, the colleagues, everyone, oh Lord, that is represented here. I pray that, Lord, you will be with our thoughts, prepare our hearts to receive your word. I pray that as uh, the good soil, we'll be able to not just get this and hear this word today, but to put it into practice and bear fruit in our lives. Lead me as I uh, minister your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Um, our life consists of what a man is thinking about all day. So said uh, one Ralph Emerson. And isn't that true? What we think is who we are, right? 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Take captive in Greek is aikmalotizo, uh, which means basically take away. The center of man's being thus becomes fully subject to the lordship of Christ. When you take captive, when you take away the thoughts, it means that everything you're going to do is going to be subject to the Lordship of Christ. It means that you have a chance to do something about all the thoughts that are not well-pleasing to God before they enter your heart and become part of you. You know, thinking is the final frontier of privacy we have left. In today's world, Everything is public. We know where you are without you telling us. Have you visited? Uh, you, you've not even visited. You're in a matatu that passed through Mama Lucy Kibaki Hospital. And when you get home, Google asks you, how was Mama Lucy? <laughs> Nothing is private. Everything is public. It is no longer a teen's campus thing. My mom is more active on Facebook than I am. <laughs> Our technology has invaded every other medium of communication we have with each other, such that it is no longer safe, it is no longer private. Our video calls are not safe, our phone calls are not safe. The only place where there are no drones, there are no hackers, is within the confines of our own minds. This is the final frontier of privacy we have left. And if it is the final frontier of privacy for me, then I refuse for you or anyone else for that matter to tell me how to think. Because thinking is all I have left. Once I open my mouth, once I type, once I post, once I DM, then my thoughts become public. And once they become public, they are going to be scrutinized and criticized from this group or that group or the other. Or liked, for that matter. And that is why I must incubate my thoughts in the womb of my mind before I bath them in the kernel of my mouth. Because once a thought is bathed, I am sorry, does not retract what you said. For those who have relationships, you know, once it comes out of your mouth, no matter how many sorries you say, it will not take away what you said. It will not take away what you did. How much attention are you paying to your thoughts? 
Once they come out, there's no going back. You know, scientists uh, have come up with uh, something called mental imagery. And uh, a lot of the psychologists use this um, to help uh, those who are struggling with the past uh, issues, those who want to succeed in something. For example, the athletes use this mental imagery and it has shown that it has improved the successful performance even before the actual event. You imagine that if you're, if you're a 100 meter athlete, you imagine the sound of the gun. You imagine yourself on your knees, your opponents around you. And then when the shot goes, you're sprinting towards the finish line. It is visualizing and experiencing the event in the theater of your mind. What we think about is crucial to who we are. Scientists don't agree how many thoughts we have each day, but all agree there are thousands of them. Who we are is shaped moment by moment, day by day, by the thoughts we choose to let in our, in our minds and in our hearts. Proverbs 20, uh, 23, verse 7. We all know this verse. For as a man thinketh, so is he. Somehow it comes out nicely in the K KJV version. King James. As a man thinketh, so is he. Everything we have today, somebody thought about it. Then they drew it. Then they got some material and bought it and then they made it. But it started out as a thought. The chair was a thought. This building was a thought. This pulpit was a thought. Everything starts in the mind. In the beginning was God. And out of the abundance of his thoughts, he spoke. And it became whatever he thought. Let there be light, let there be skies, let there be heavens, let there be water. Let there be light, let there be darkness. Before he spoke it, let there be light, and it became what he thought. It became what he said, because what he said had to be what he thought. And so you become great in your minds before you, before you become great on a stage or in whatever you, you do. Before you show up for that interview, before you kick that ball, if you're a footballer, before you start doing those exams, you become great before you do anything. You can be a great preacher. And then you get in the car or in the matatu and the enemy will fight you in your thoughts all the way home because the enemy knows that the thoughts are the bath canal through which your preaching comes. And if he can convince you that you're not enough, if he can convince you that you're weak, if he can convince you that you're a sinner and cannot be forgiven, then he manages to terminate your ministry. He manages to kill your home, to kill your children. He manages to terminate those that you would have influenced around you. Because the devil can't shut your mouth, but he can shut down your thoughts. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I want us to look at someone whose thoughts we can learn from. Luke chapter 8, verse 43 to 48. This is the story of the, believing, uh, the bleeding woman. Point number one, believe.
As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. He was on his way to heal Jairus' daughter. Okay? On his way, the crowds were crashing against him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. But no one could heal her. By the way, the Jairus' daughter was 12 years old. The, the daughter was going to be healed. So there are a lot of uh, symbolism there on the 12. But no one could heal her. She came up behind him, verse 44, and touched the edge of his clock. And immediately her bleeding stopped. 45, who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. We cannot know who touched you. Of course, people are touching you. But Jesus said, no, no, no. Someone touched me because I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Twelve years of suffering. Twelve years of bleeding. The women here can almost try to relate. And even if you're not a woman, you can imagine consistent bleeding for 12 years. In the Kiswahili version, it says that alitembelea wa ganga wengi. Hakuna ambaye limponya. And so this woman probably is sitting away from the crowd because she's an outcast. She's unclean. So she's standing or sitting away from the crowd and just seeing Jesus walking. And what does she do? In the womb of her mind. You know, we all wrestle with insufficiency complex. Don't we? Am I the only one who sometimes feels insufficient? No, scratch that. Not sometimes. Most of the time. I feel weak. And that's the reason most of us fail. Because of the way we talk to ourselves. Change the way you talk to yourself. Because the only thing the woman with the issue of the blood did that saved her from dying was change the way she talked to herself. So she said within herself, so she's watching the crowd, she said within herself, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. The greatest someone starts within you. The greatest messages ever preached are within you. So what you're saying to yourself will either make or break you and what you're doing with your life. The woman said, if I may. Do you realize there's no scripture that says if you touch Jesus' garment, you will be healed? It hadn't happened. Had it? He, this, this was not quoting any scripture. This was in her mind. If I touch the garment, then I'll be made whole. But that was how, that was the way she thought about it. Like there was no definition for life when God said, let there be light. But it became what he thought. For this woman, there was no definition for hurting and healing by touching the hem of his garment. But she thought the thought. And she said to herself, and it truly became what she thought. 
if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And she crawled through the crowd, not minding what the people around her, not minding what people thought about her, not minding the gravity of the situation that Jesus was going to resolve. Through the crowds, on her hands. If she's touching the garment, she's not standing. She's crawling inside the crowds. How far are you willing to go to bath the thoughts, the faith that you have? You know, God doesn't make chairs. God doesn't make tables. Does he? God doesn't make beds, but he made the trees. It is our role to imagine what can come out of the trees. God has given you a child. God has given you a spouse. God has given you a ministry. God has given you your family. What do you imagine they can be? When you look at your spouse, what do you see? Do you see the nagging wife? Do you see the angry spouse? Do you see the disobedient child, the rebellious sibling. What do you see? Imagine those things and then start praying for those things. It's time to stop complaining. My wife is like this and like that. These children God gave me, I don't know what to do with them. These parents, they don't understand me. Start praying for those things that you will see in those people that are around you. You see, this story is not telling us what we will, that, that we will always be healed. But rather, it's telling us what it will look like reaching out to Jesus in times of pain, in times of heartache, in times of isolation and loneliness, in order to receive the gift of truth. If we go beyond what we are seeing, then we will see that our Jesus, our Lord, loves us, that he knows us intimately, because Jesus knew something happened. And he looked back and said, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Do not underestimate the power of gravity. We know gravity. The force that pulls us down. Eh? Go crawling against the resistance of the winds and the gra gravitational pull towards mediocrity, towards faithlessness. Failing is easy. If you are climbing a rope, all you have to do is fall asleep. And the gravitational pull will do its job. You know, gravity is never satisfied by how far it will pull you down. It will take you as low as possible. The only thing standing between you and the, and the evil one is the grip you have. It is hard. You're sweating. You're tired of everything and everyone who is feeding off you. You can't hold on. You feel like this is it. I am done. All you have to do is look down and remember, if I let go of this rope, if I let go of this relationship, if I let go of this job, if I let go of this situation, 
That's it. And then you keep on climbing and climbing because what you can see is success ahead of you. What you can see is God answering your prayers. What you can see is the love and the warm embrace of God telling you, I am with you. Now, we've been going through a rough patch as a church. We've lost people. COVID has dealt us blows in different ways. And I don't know what this current situation means to you. To the teens, to the young ones, the campus, I don't know what these things mean to you. To me, it means that I have to step up. To me, it means that the time is now. So we were discussing the other day with some of the brothers and those, those, we were celebrating someone who turned 50. And it was very clear in their minds, those who had turned 50, that now it is the second half. <laughs> First half is gone. And if you've seen Mourinho play, those who love football, the second half, if he went in one nil up, what does he do? He packs the bus. Strategy changes. Because this is the second half. You, you now start talking like a wise man. You start ignoring some things. So you no longer, if you drive, you no longer fight with forward travelers. If you see a young man run past you, you don't try to catch them. It is the second half. And unfortunately, the second half comes with grief. It comes with death. It comes with sickness. The struggles are real. So if you are a young man like me, it is time to step up. It is time to stand up and be counted. It is time to put childish ways behind and take this church to the next level. We don't have all the time in the world. And if you think so, go try taking a mortgage today. And you'll be told how many years you have. You see, there are some who have gone ahead of us. But those of us who are here, myself, I am standing here because my parents, my grandparents, my disciples, my mentors, all of them are standing here with me today. I am saying that we are the sum total of everything that has happened to all of those who came before us. To all of those who have gone before us. To the young ones, even though your grandfather is dead, He's still living inside of you. Your great-grandfather, you might not even have seen him, but his wisdom is in the way you think, is in the way you write, is in the way you process and move and live. And I am saying that on the blood of all those who have gone before us, we cannot be the generation that drops the ball. Because they survived perils, they survived sickness, they survived destruction. They took something and built something and became something and out of nothing. Some with no running water, some with no highways, some with no cars, with no trains and buses, no ovens and no microwaves. 
No Apple phones and no emojis. And no Twitters and nothing. And they still made something. If they did all that, then COVID will not stop us. It is time to start reaching out if you have not been reaching out. It is time to start sharing your faith, to live like a disciple. Kaspar reminded us that God died so that we may be healed. A sick person is not able to do some things. So if you're not doing these things that God has instructed us to do, you're sick. And it's time to remember God's love. It's time to remember that we can be healed. And we can do these things. I will let, I will let nothing separate me from the love of God. I will not drop this ball. Point number two, God is our weapon. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 5 to 12. We read here the story of King Jehoshaphat, one of the kings of Israel, one of the few ones who did in accordance to God's will. It reads, Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, At this point he had been told that the army of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir were coming to attack them. Three armies in one. Three in one. This is not one army. Two. Three in one. And of course, Jehoshaphat knew the size of his army. He knew what he can do by his own strength. And so what does he do? He brings everybody together and says, let us pray. Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule all over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you will not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did, it, and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. It is significant that in Jehoshaphat's prayer, the first four verses, six to nine, focus on God himself. Finally, in the last three verses, 10 to 12, he mentions the problem. But even in mentioning the problem, God is prominent. I wonder if we were facing imminent death, imminent annihilation, would we be so God-centered? In a crisis, we, if we pray, and that is if we pray at all, what do we usually pray for? What do we normally pray for? God, get me out of here, right? God, I have been your servant. Get me out of here. I don't deserve this. Isn't that what we often pray for? We want relief, and we want it now. Like Eno.
you want fast relief. But in so praying, we miss something very crucial. In a crisis, we are not supposed to run and get God off the shelf like Aladdin's genie. We know Aladdin's a kettle, eh? and we rub it. And God comes and says, what can I do for you? You have three wishes. Go. And get what we want. Once we get what we want, we put him back on the shelf. Until the next crisis. Trials should cause us to seek God himself. Because he himself is what we need. See, see what I've said there. We are, we are asking to seek God in times of crisis. Not a relief out of it. Trials should cause us to seek God himself. God is our sufficiency. He's our very life. If we have God and cling to him, then even if we are not delivered from our crisis, we can go through it. Even if he doesn't take you away from that situation, you will triumph. You will be victorious. Even through the loss of children, through the loss of sisters and brothers, of parents, through the loss of possessions and jobs. The Lord will remain our friend. Our trials should force us to lay hold of God in new ways that we will not have done if we were not driven to pray. We should come away, not just, in, not just having presented our request to God, but also knowing God better. Who himself is our refuge and strength in times of trouble. And we can say like Job, now I know. Now I know that you love me. Now I know that you are powerful. In our prayers, we should ask God to reveal himself. See, Jehoshaphat's prayer is steeped in scripture. He starts in 20 verse 6, reciting God's attributes. He says, you are the God of our fathers. Implying, you took care of them. You were still God then. You are God in the heavens the ruler of all the kingdoms of the nations, including those ones that are threatening us. You are so powerful and mighty that no one can stand against you. Why is he telling God all this? Is it that God doesn't know he's powerful? Do you think God is not aware of his strengths? Certainly not for God's information. He was rehearsing in his own mind and in the people's minds the greatness of God so that they could trust in him. Remember mental imagery? He was, he was rehearsing. He was, he was reminding himself of who he's talking to, what he has done, what he can do. Next, he recites God's actions. He starts by talking about God's attributes. Next, he talks about God's actions. 20 verse 7, you drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and you gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. He reminds God of his agreement to hear the prayers of his people when they cry to him. 
When you cry out in distress, you promise to deliver us. And, and what is happening to the people's minds as they are hearing this prayer? But ah, for those who had forgotten, there is someone on our side. Like Elijah telling his servants, open your eyes to see those that are fighting with us. Then Jehoshaphat mentions the problem. After mentioning God's attributes, God's actions, talks about the problem. He reminds God that in fact these people are existing because you told us to spare their lives. If it wasn't for you, or if it wasn't for us obeying your word, these people will not even be there. Now see what they are doing. They are about to drive Israel out of their possession. God's possession. Finally, he calls attention to God's abilities to deal with the problem. And I like this. He calls upon God's ability to deal with the problem in contrast to Israel's inability to deal with the situation at hand. 20 verse 12 says, Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I am down. I am discouraged. I am hurt, I am grieving, but our hearts, my mind is on you. Because we know you will deliver us. And we know what happened after that. These guys killed each other. First, Mount Seir, the, first the Ammon and Moabites turned on Mount Seir, and then they turned on each other. They did not have to lift a finger. The work that the Israelites did was to go around collecting the treasures that were left behind. There was so much to collect, it took them three days. Isn't that amazing? This is a great prayer. And the reason I read this prayer is, I will tell you many things about your thoughts. I will tell you many things about you can overcome. But the devil is always very active in our lives. Trouble and persecution is always around us. So I want to tell you what to do when those things come. Be like Jehoshaphat. This is a great prayer because it is saturated with scripture. It focuses on God as he has revealed himself in his word. If we fill our prayers with the greatness of our problems, we will shrink our faith. But if we fill our prayers with the greatness of our God and how he has worked through history, for the teens, how he has worked through our parents, through those who we have seen come before us, the singles, if he has worked with those who have been in singles before. Then we will stimulate our faith. God delights to answer believing prayers. Where we put our finger in the promises and truth in his word and ask him to make it so in our case. The author of a book called Hiding, The Hiding Place, Corey Ten, says is, he was a survivor of the German concentration camps in the World War II. Says, uh, Corey, people would ask her, Corey, what a great faith you have. She would smile and reply, No. It is what a great God I have. We can be confident in a time of crisis if we let our great 
need drive us to prayer and faith in our great God. First Peter 5 verse 10, And the God of all grace, who called you to his, turn, his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. Every now and then, a man's mind is stretched by a new idea or sensation, and it never shrinks back to its former dimensions. I pray that today will be the start of great things. Today, I beseech you to believe again. Today, I remind you that you can do th all things through Christ who strengthens you. Today, I pray for God's grace in your life. Thank you. Good morning, church. How do you feel from that message? Wow, Male, thank you so much. Man, personally, I'm so, so much encouraged, Male. You know, one of the things that uh, I love from Male, Male is one of the guys that is blessed with a lot of wisdom eh? from God. And, uh, man, you know, yesterday we were spending time, eh? and uh, several of us, eh? and I remember uh, that, uh, you know, we, we, were, we were going through our life. You know, some of the things that we used to do before, the great things that we used to have, you know, good fun that we used to have. And one of the things that was coming out very clear is that, uh, you know, we were supported. And we were supported by the scriptures. And the scriptures spoken to our heart. And we implement those scriptures because God wanted us to do them, to implement them, and to apply them into our life. So teenagers, Mala is living as a legend, as an example of those who are coming from preteens, teenagers, you know, of those who are coming from campus, you know, is living as an example. And all of us as teenagers, we have to implement such an example. Because that is what God wants from us. And this church will be able to grow if all of us we will set such kind of example. Amen. So for me, I'm so grateful, Male. That was a great class. And uh, Male has just reminded us, you know, the things that we think in our mind. This, the things that we thought of in our mind are very important. Because they will reflect our life. They will determine our life. They will determine our tomorrow. And I like the scriptures that Male was able to share. You know, those are scriptures that I, myself, I, I, I love reading them. You know, like, like the bleeding woman. You know, after, after, after 12 years, those are many years, eh? Those are many years. You know, but, but he did not give up. He continues, you know, seeking the face of God. And that's why he scrolled, because he needed to be healed. He needed to get better. He knew what he wanted. When I look at Josephus, the army, you know, it's, it's, it's just encouraging that what Josephus did. You know, the Bible says Josephus reserved and inquired from the Lord. You know, it doesn't matter the challenges, brothers and sisters, that we go through. It doesn't matter the, the, the things that we face every day. The only way is to inquire from the Lord. And that is what the Bible is telling us. What happened to Josephus? Did he fail? No. He achieved the first army. I'm just imagining the first army, how it was. But the only thing that Josephus did, he focused to the Lord. He knew what God will do to him. He prayed. He seeked the face of God. And God was able to relieve him by protecting him from the force. Amen. 
Thank you so much, Male. We can clap for that message. <laughs> also, thank you so much for Craspers for such a grateful Holy uh, Communion. I think for me, I'm learning that, uh, you know, despite what uh, Jesus went through a lot, he suffered because of my sin. And uh, because of my rebellions, because of my weakness, you know, Jesus suffered because he wanted me to have his relationship, my relationship with him. And I, it's my prayer that every time I need to focus and I need to make sure that I have that uh, relationship that he need me to have with him. Amen. And uh, I want also to appreciate uh, Maxine and uh, the brother Nathan. I think uh, I was so encouraged, you know, to see Nathan just uh, praying a powerful prayer. Thank you so much. We appreciate for that. Let's clap for them. <laughs> Amen. I have a few announcements. Eh? One of the announcements that you guys, you are aware of uh, 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 Martin, Martin Kamodo. Martin Kamodo is the, the brother to, to Isaac and Samuel. Kamodo is a disciple of Jesus. He's our father. And uh, Martin has been going through challenge. He's supposed to, to go through schedule uh, for such, uh, heart surgery. That is, uh, is happening tomorrow. So our, our request, Martin is coming from campus ministry. Our request is just uh, to pray for him. It's not easy. And uh, let's continue to pray to the family. It is challenging financially. It's also challenging because uh, we don't know what will happen. We only depend on God. Eh? So let's continue praying for the family. Uh, Martin is scheduled for surgery tomorrow. It's a heart surgery. Tomorrow, I don't know what time. But uh, it's in tomorrow. So let's continue praying for him. I uh, also have an, one announcement. On 2026, 20, we are going to have our AGM. So I would want you to write it down. On 26, we are going to have an AGM. I believe... Uh, I pray that we'll prepare for that. Then another one, uh, there is a thank note. I read it the way it is. Huh? Thank church all. Of, thank church for keeping me in your prayers when I was unwell. I'm well now. Glory be to God from Pamela Ayub. Thank you so much, Pamela. Okay, I don't have another announcement. We can pray. Okay. Uh, this announcement for sisters, disciples. All the sisters, disciples who have been baptized this year, 2021, to meet in front of the hall with the leads. In front of the hall. That means here. Eh? So all the sisters who have been baptized this year to meet in front of the hall here. Okay. Let's pray together. Let's stand. Let's pray. Our dear mighty God, God who is in heaven, we come to you this morning or this afternoon, God. We know that, Lord, we are sinners. We have fallen short of your glory. We have gone against your will. God Almighty, we have trusted ourselves more than you, God. I pray that, Lord Almighty, you help us. You give us the permissible heart, the heart that is willing, God Almighty, to change and to become better like your son, Jesus Christ, God. God, our Father, forgive us for our sin. We know we have fallen short of your glory in so many ways, God. Sometimes, God Almighty, we believe in ourselves. And we forget to know that, Lord Almighty, we need to believe in the name of your son, Jesus. I pray that, Lord, may you help us 
May you consider us before your eyes. May you have favor before us, God, and all your mercies to us, God, oh, Father. Thank you so much, God Almighty, for your son, Jesus Christ, who died to the cross because of our sin. We were blameless, God. And God Almighty, here we are. We come before you, God Almighty, praying and asking you for your presence to fill our heart, to nourish us, to help us, God Almighty, to view your ways and to examine ourselves and to walk in accordance to your will, Father. I pray that, Lord, may you give us the will. May you give us the faith. May you give us the trust. May you give us the dependence of you, God Almighty, that we will not rely on ourselves, but we will rely on you. I want to appreciate, Father Lord, this morning for using our brother, Malik, God Almighty. He has spoken to our heart, Father. We know that, Lord Almighty, when Joseph was able to face the armed, uh, the, the armed force, God Almighty, of army, the only thing that he did, God Almighty, he prayed. He chose to pray. He chose to look at you, God Almighty, because he knew, God Almighty, in his mind, it is only you, God, who will be able to give him the, release, the relief, God. And you did it, God of Father. And I pray that, Lord of oh my God, we will always look forward, God Almighty, to depend on you. We will always run to you, God. When always, God Almighty, we face this kind of bleeding, this kind of pain, this kind of challenges, this kind of hard times, God Almighty, we will not look aside. We will not uh, focus to other things, God Almighty, but we will run to you because we know that, Lord of Father, you are the only one who will be able to give us that relief that we need in our life, Father. Thank you so much, Father, again. I pray for Martin, God Almighty. I know, God Almighty, you are the ultimate healer, God. I know, God Almighty, the healing comes from you. The power comes from you, God Almighty. I pray for him, God Almighty. Tomorrow, as we, we, are, we have been told, God Almighty is going just to, to I schedule for his uh, surgery, at his surgery, God. How high it is, how challenging it is, God of Father. We can't do anything, but we rely on you, God. We depend on you, God Almighty. We run to you, God of Father, because we know the healing will come from you, God. So I want to put this morning, this afternoon, God Almighty, our brother Martin, God. I pray that, Father, when this healing will be, when this surgery will be done, Father, and we hear good news that our brother has come out powerfully and strong, God Almighty. All the glory, all the honor will be back to you, Father. Pray, God, that Lord Almighty, may you just, even right, right, right now, God Almighty, I know right now he's going to be admitted and already is in hospital, God. Father, your hand is already working. We believe and we want to believe that already your hand is working. And Father, we pray that, Lord Almighty, that God, the healing, is, is already done, God. In the name of Jesus, we believe that the healing is already done, Father Lord. Thank you so much, Father Lord Almighty, for guiding our life. We know many of us are going through challenges. We know many of us are facing hard time, Father Lord. God who is in heaven, we call upon your name. We pray that, Lord Almighty, may you be able to see them through God. The tough time. Jobless, God of Father. I know, Lord Almighty, the COVID has come with different challenges. But God who is in heaven, where, where can we look at? Where can we run to, God Almighty? We know that, Lord, you are the only one. As we have been told, God Almighty, this morning, that we know, God Almighty, we, can run, we cannot run anywhere, God. We will always run from you, God. And here we are, God. We, we are begging you. We are requesting you, God. May you be with us, God. May you encourage us. May you give us a grateful time. May you provide to us, Father Lord, so that we can be able to provide to our families, God. We thank you so much. Be with us, God Almighty. May you encourage us. Give us a wonderful fellowship. Give us a wonderful evening. When we meet again, God Almighty, all the glory and all the honor shall be back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord. Na 
mwezi unaangaza mambo haina nyesha ni uwezo wa Mungu imba